In this section, we're going to review some of the basic concepts that underlie all statistics. These are sort of basic ideas that govern all sort of empirical judgments in which you want to score something and make sense out of um, data values. On the first slide, we have some basic definitions of um, uh, concepts that will be used all through the course. The first of these is a variable. And the concept of a variable is probably something that you understand already. It's specifically defined here because it deals with a set of measurements on a construct. And you probably don't necessarily think in those terms when you're thinking of a variable. A variable is a uh, set of measurements that vary, that measure a construct. And so common constructs are things like height, your mood, your IQ. Just about anything that we think we can measure is a construct. It's crucial to, to define what these constructs are in the measurement tools used to, uh, to assess them. Obviously, you assess a height very differently than you assess something like IQ. They are both, however, variables. They're sets of measurements over a construct of a construct, and they constitute the uh, major unit of statistical analysis. A value or a score is one measurement for, for the variable, uh, for the construct. So it's a single score, a single value, refers to one subject's measurement on uh, the construct. Now, the mo probably one of the most important things to um, understand in statistics is the concept of variance. The fact that scores vary over observations. Uh, one, if you can capture in your mind the concept of variance, half of what you need to understand all statistics because statistics deals with variability. It deals with high scores and low scores and how to account for those, how to explain them, how to predict them, uh, what do they mean. So variance is in a very, very important construct, a very, very important uh, concept that underlies all statistics. And variance is it's deceptively simple concept. It's something that seems very simple and straightforward. It's just when you try to quantify it and deal with it, you realize that it's a uh, quite complex sort of idea. It is, in a sense, the unit of analysis, the unit of um, contrast, the unit of examination for making inferences about statistics. And let's think about what variance means. Uh, contrast, for example, the variability in a, in, in a um, variable like uh, body temperature versus variability that's in an IQ score. Uh, body temperatures don't seem to vary much, and they certainly don't vary much. If you think about everyone's body temperature, it's approximately 98.6. The reason it's 98.6 is because warm-blooded animals, um, they uh, have a different metabolism than reptiles and fish and so on. And what happens is the enzymes in your body that metabolize carbohydrates, for example, they work best at 98.6. And you may have wondered from time to time, or maybe not, why, why is it 98.6? Why isn't it 98 or 95 or 102? Uh, why is everyone's body temperature 98.6? And if it goes up very much, it's considered pathological. If it goes down very much, it's considered pathological. You know, there's something wrong with you if your body temperature is at 99. Uh, and if it goes higher than that, it can be quite uh, severely wrong. You have set um, uh, points in your in your in your uh, uh, nervous system. You have cells in your nervous system in your brain that monitor your the temperature of your blood. And when your body temperature goes above a certain point or goes below a certain point, certain processes are kicked in to keep your body temperature right at 98.6. So a variable like body temperature doesn't vary much. If you took measurements and everybody uh, in the room, you discover that there, there's a very small variability in body temperature. And some of that might just be coming from how it was measured. And everyone's body temperature is very, very close. So a variable like that has very low variance. The mean or the average body temperature is approximately the same as everyone's body temperature. There isn't uh, distances from that mean. There aren't highs. There aren't people with body temperatures 102 people with body temperatures at 88, you know, in, the, in their natural uh, condition. So the variability of like body temperature is very constrained. It's very narrow around the mean, around the average body temperature. 
Now, a variable like IQ, IQs are designed to have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, which we'll learn more about standard deviation later. But they're designed that, to have an average about that number, and you know from experience that people have low IQs and people have higher IQs that the variability is quite uh, large. It's not gigantic, but it's large. It's certainly greater than it is for body temperature. And what that means is there's a spread around the average. So there's some people with high scores, some people with low scores, some people with scores that are close to the average. And variance is the measurement of the distances from individual scores to the average of a distribution of scores. So if we were to take 20 people and measure their body temperature, we discover that there's not much distance from the average body temperature to everyone else's body, everyone's body temperature in the sample. If you do that with IQ, you might discover there's more variability. So the average IQ of, say, a group of 20 people might be, say, 108 or 110 or something. And then you'll discover some people that have IQs of 120, some people have IQs of, of 100. And there's distance from individual scores to the average score. So there's more variability in an IQ measurement than there is in a body temperature measurement. And discovering why there are highs and lows and what for them is a lot of what science is about. And it's certainly analyzing these things um, empirically, uh, measuring them, carefully measuring these distances, and describing them to get the pattern that's there, and then drawing inferences about the highs and lows allows us to assign probabilities to contrasts and probabilities to conclusions. It allows us to test hypotheses about, about why some people are high and other people are low. Okay, well, um, now that we know about variables and scores, we have to understand that scores representing variables have to be measured in some way. And all these measurements involve uh, different measurement tools, different measurement uh, strategies or instrumentation. And uh, great advances in science have come from just uh, measuring things better, or measuring things with um, greater validity and accuracy. Uh, measurement tools are a big part of um, what, what it means to uh, apply statistics. There's entire books written on measurement theory and how it's, how it's uh, studied. We're just going to review a couple concepts from it that are particularly relevant to introductory statistics. The first of these is reliability. And reliability refers generally to the consistency of measurement, usually over time. Basically, it refers to the error that's in the measurement tool. So if you have a thermometer, for example, that is um, uh, made from materials that aren't measuring temperature just right, you'll introduce error in the measurement of temperature. And that error can be quantified in the measurement tool. And the unreliability is the degree to which random variation has crept into the measurement tool. So if I want to uh, measure IQ, I need to make sure I have a reliable IQ test. If I want to measure height, I have to make sure I have a reliable um, ruler. I have to have an instrument that measures the, the uh, construct and renders scores uh, with consistency. So they don't have error in them that comes uh, a, a variety of sources, wherever the error is coming from. Usually error is defined by um, the kind of tool that's been designed and what the uh, uh, measurement strategy is often render certain kinds of error and unreliability. You have to go from instrument to instrument to figure out the reliability of it. You can't uh, necessarily assume that you can predict reliabilities until you actually go out there and measure, make, take lots of measurements, study reliability and consistency. Then you can figure out if your thermometer is made with the right materials or not. Okay, well, here's an example in psychology. Um, it's interesting about psychology versus physical sciences. In the physical sciences, reliability is often not an issue, even though they do uh, deal with it from time to time. They're usually designing instrumentation that's uh, perfectly reliable or so close to being perfectly reliable that they don't even think about whether or not their thermometer is not correctly. If they start to get error in their instrumentation, they just redesign all their instrumentation, and they work on that until they get measurements that are uh, consistent and reliable. In psychology, we have a different problem in the sense that a lot of our measurement tools have um, a fair amount of, of, un of error in them, random variation in them. There's so much that 
psychologists have actually contributed a lot to the study of measurement, measurement theory because our instrumentation was so unreliable, and still a lot of it still is. Uh, but because that's such a big issue in psychology, psychologists actually apply themselves to try to figure out how to assess reliability, what kinds of reliability there were, and things like that to uh, improve measurement. Okay, well, reliability refers to this consistency of measurement. And I have an example here of, in physical sciences, I mean, if you imagine if you have a ruler that's uh, measuring length, and um, you're measuring length over the course of days, and you're using a wooden ruler. Well, you know that wood will expand slightly or contract with the humidity and with temperature. And I think you could understand that if you were measuring with this wooden ruler, you discover that over time, your measurements of, say, the length of a table would be slightly off because of this uh, expansion and adjustment with temperature and, and uh, humidity. Uh, that that uh, wooden ruler is going to render unreliable measurements of its materials. Uh, however, the reliability in a ruler, even a wooden ruler, is actually quite good. And there's, of course, ways of improving rulers to make them even more reliable. Uh, but imagine if you had a, had a test in which you were going to examine somebody's memory for phone numbers and you gave them your phone number test uh, 10 times, you discover there's probably quite a bit of uh, variability in the scores. You know, in some trials, the person remembers, you know, um, 5 out of 10 phone numbers. The next time they remember 8 or 9 out of 10 phone numbers. And you discover that even though their ability is probably the same, the test itself is showing error. There's, there's this random variability that's coming into it because of its design. Uh, getting that unreliability out, getting that error out of measurement is a big um, uh, you know, problem in psychology, a big activity to, to, uh, that's related to improving instrumentation. Uh, in order to have accurate scores and reliable scores for statistical analysis, the instrumentation that you're using to make these scores and make these measurements has to be reliable and consistent. And that's what reliability refers to, is this consistency. Uh, obviously, you could imagine if you have inconsistent measurement, how that's going to affect your statistics and the um, inferences that you make from the numbers. If they're not reliable, reliable numbers to begin with, you know you can imagine problems you're going to have trying to uh, draw inferences from numbers that are have random variation in them. Uh, the, sometimes in psychology, you, the best you can do is get the reliability down to a point that's tolerable. Uh, usually, you can't eliminate it completely. And I think actually psychologists have become kind of um, um, indifferent to the issue because there's so much inherent unreliability in, in the instrumentation. Uh, but a lot of our measures are, are uh, poorly designed and the reliability could be improved if we focused on that. And, and a, lot of, a lot of tests that we design, the measurement tools that we design, we tolerate relatively high, high error and uh, we, we don't even think about how to redesign instrumentation to bring that error down. We just live with relatively high error and go about making our inferences as if the reliability was uh, really high. Validity refers to the accuracy by which a measurement device actually measures or assesses the construct that is theoretically defined to measure. So a valid measurement is one that measures the construct that is stated in the title of the instrument, that's theoretically been stated as the construct that's going to be measured. And validity assessment has a lot to do with the validity of constructs. So when I select like distance, I define that a certain way, and that prescribes a certain kind of measurement tool. If I have a construct like IQ, I have to define that and then specify what kind of test or device is used to assess IQ. Uh, you can have very consistent and reliable invalid instrumentation. So if I, here's a really here's a real egregious example. If I say, okay, I'm going to go out and design an arithmetic test. Contains 10 items, and these 10 items contains words that you spell. Well, any reasonable person is going to notice right away that what I'm calling my arithmetic test is not arithmetic at all. It's spelling. It's another construct. Now that seems pretty simple and straightforward because it's such a, a uh, clear, concrete example of where a test can be invalid. Sometimes in psychology, though, the constructs we use you know, are quite abstract, and it's very difficult to figure out exactly what the measurement tool is that should be used to assess them. 
uh, that's another thing that psychologists have ruminated a lot about, thought a lot about, because we deal with with uh, constructs that are quite abstract. In the physical sciences, when you're talking about temperature or distance, um, it's it's pretty easy to design, in a sense, easy from a validity sense, to design an instrument that's going to measure those things because they're very clear what they are. There's a, there's a there's a great deal of reliability and language about them, theory about them. You know what what theoretically temperature is. When I have a construct like intelligence or a construct like psychological depression or a construct, virtually every construct in psychology, the simple definition of them is often controversial. It's not clear to all the investigators using that construct what it is. Well, if the, if the construct isn't well defined, then you can't define the measurement tool. They go hand in hand. Example of validity. Uh, this is actually a real test. This is a test that we use in neuropsychology to um, estimate someone's an, uh, IQ level before a head injury, before a neurological injury. And it's called the National Adult Reading Test. Various uh, versions of this have been developed, both for the uh, United Kingdom as well as the U.S., because obviously our English differs a bit. And uh, it consists of a set of items that you see there. Look them over carefully and try to figure out what the construct is that's being measured. It's called a reading test, but there's something much more subtle about these, this kind of reading. If you notice, the words in this test are not words that can be sounded out phonetically. So if you're going to read them, you have had to memorize what the sounds are associated with words and what they visually look like. So when you see the word like, um, well, any of these, uh, T-H-Y-M-E. Now, if you were to pronounce that, read it phonetically, it would be thyme. Now you all know, if you're familiar with that spice, that that's pronounced time. So you don't pronounce the th with the the sound like you usually would. You have to memorize what that word looks like and compare that to a set of memories you have about the sounds associated with that word. Well, those memorizations occur in schooling. And people that have a high degree of schooling have memorized a lot of these. And people with less schooling have memorized fewer. If you've mastered phonetic decoding, you can read other words. If you've uh, mastered this kind of reading, you've mastered an association between a visual form and a uh, sound sequence associated with the word. This is a better estimate of your education than a simple reading test would be or just noting your years of education. If you can read some of these later words that uh, you've had to memorize, somebody had to sit, you had to sit down with someone who told you, you know, the correct pronunciation of this is, you know, gist, hiatus, and so on. And you said, okay, I'm going to memorize that. I'm going to remember what that word looks like and forget about sounding it out. I'm just going to memorize what it looks like and what these sounds are that are associated with it. A lot of these words came from a period in which uh, there's a transition in English from uh, essentially the spoken uh, oral English to a printed uh, English in which people uh, had mass production of printing. And the uh, print standardized spelling, and what they, what they did in England was they standardized the spelling on the London pronunciations at the time, I believe around the 15th century or so, and then later on, English changed. Uh, the English uh, began to speak the, the, the sound forms that were used in the Midlands. And, but they didn't change the spelling. And so a word like night, K-N-I-G-H-T, used to be sounded out something like that in London. Then as time went along, they used the Midlands pronunciation, which is what we use today, night. But they didn't change the spelling. And a lot of the spelling that we have is, is an artifact of that time. It's a shame that we don't revise the spelling. For some reason, we believe that spelling ought to be something that um, is, uh, doesn't change over time and is carved in stone, when actually it's an indelible property of the sound qualities of the language. At any rate, what this test is, is a construct of reading, but it's a subset of reading skill that, that, that deals with for word forms and so on. So it's not just a reading test. It's an actually a specialized reading test. And you can see the kind of analysis that I've done the validity 
uh, of the test, using it simply as a reading test would be inappropriate. Using it as we do in neuropsychology as an estimate of education might be more appropriate because of the theoretical analysis that I've done. At any rate, validity always comes from a theoretical analysis. You can do statistical studies to try to uh, uh, hy- try to basically to discover hypothesis, test hypotheses about validity, but what it comes down to is, is still a theoretical analysis of what is my construct and how does that result in, a, in an, an assessment, a measurement tool that measures that construct, the thing that I say that I'm measuring. Okay, well obviously if you don't have valid measurements, you're not going to make correct inferences and statistics. And a lot of times, we about, uh, we, again, psychologists often skip over this step. They don't really don't analyze the validity of their instrumentation, and they make all kinds of inferences about their studies from a poor model of validity. It's important to understand that you can criticize studies on this basis as well as reliability and maybe figure out why something didn't come out as predicted or, or otherwise. Now we've got um, types of variables. Variables can have a scaling quality to them uh, that varies with the usually the validity of the construct and the method that was used to assess the construct and measure things. You can have uh, variables that are measured uh, very discreetly according to scaling that has a zero point and has uh, each unit representing a uh, monotonically increasing uh, level for each uh, unit, like a thermometer. You know, thermometer has a zero, absolute zero, molecular motion stops, and then you have levels above that that represent the oscillation of molecules in the material that's hotter and hotter or colder and colder. And that's a kind of scaling. And then you can have a kind of scaling that something like, say, uh, job categories. So you have, you're going to analyze data from a business and you need to categorize people's jobs. Well, there's no relationship between the jobs. They're just categories. They're just names for different kinds of jobs. You can have scalings that represent rank orders and things like that, like the rank order in a swimming race. So first, second, third, fourth, and so on represent an order. But the levels in between each rank might be quite different. So somebody that came in fourth place, even though it's just one unit away from third, may have gotten a really, really low or slow score on the race. Uh, And the differences between the first, second, and third place finishers may have been very close. At any rate, these kinds of uh, scalings have a, have a uh, consequences for how you analyze data and the kind of inferences that you make and the kind of statistics that you can apply. Statistics being based on probability, most statistics are best applied when the uh, scaling is, is not categorical, if it's some kind of numeric or quantitative uh, scaling. It's very hard to analyze nominal or categorical variables. <coughs> <clears throat> because they, it's hard to conform them to, to uh, theories of probability. Okay, well, the first two types you see there are nominal or categorical. And I've given examples of that, so occupational categories. Example of nominal, nominal or categorical. Nominal here refers to names, naming things. So occupations are a good example where you just name something. Now, occupational status might actually be a numerical scale. But occupations are just names for categories that people are in. And they don't necessarily represent any kind of scaling. You could even give them numbers. So you could have somebody, say an accountant would be a number one, a psychologist would be number two, you know, a physician would be number three, a nurse would be number four, a uh, business manager might be number five. But you can see there's no relationship between those things. They're just naming categories that people are in. Now, occupational status might be something you quantify. It might be a construct you can measure and quantify numerically. But the occupation categories are just that. They're just names for designations that people are in. Now, the next level up are quantitative, and um, you have different kinds of those. Uh, basically, you have quantitative scalings. The differences between the, the types of quantitative scalings have to do with the uh, validity of unit measurements in between each scale. So if I have rank order in a race, like I said before, you can have people that are first, second, third, fourth. The unit in between is one. So, you know, the difference between a one and a two is one, and the difference between a three and a four is one. For the construct, or the, the say, the speed of finishing a race, or the ability of the racer, is not necessarily captured by those rankings. So somebody that scored 
you know, fourth place could have done really, really badly. But because there's only four people in the race, it, it makes them look quite well. They're just one unit away from the third place finisher who may have, done, who may have had a really good time. At any rate, the rank orders uh, have a weakness. They represent a key of scaling, but the unit designations between each level can be quite variable, and there can be a lot of information lost by ranking things. Ordinal scales are another, kind, are another word, essentially, for ranking. Ordinal scales are where you, you establish an order, but the values in between, the unit values in between, don't necessarily represent one unit um, Exactly. They can represent quite a disparity of actual measurement. It might actually be one. Now, equal interval scales are ones in which the units have equal weight. So if, if uh, somebody's a one, they're one unit higher than somebody that's a two. If somebody's a three, they're three units below somebody who's a one, and so on. The unit values actually have uh, meaning. They actually have validity. So a really good example, like we have here, is a thermometer. A thermometer has a zero value. If you have a, what's called a ratio scale, uh, it doesn't really make that much difference for most statistics whether there's a zero or not. But it is kind of a special scale that has a zero. There are a lot of scales that don't have zeros. And lots of scales in psychology don't have zero levels. So IQ, for example, is a good, ex um, a good example of that. IQ does not have a zero value. The lowest IQ score you can get for most tests is around 40 or 50. Okay, but at any rate, the levels in between, so somebody, somebody that has a butter of, of um, 92, you know, is exactly two units above somebody that has a body temperature of 90. It's two units below someone that has a body temperature of 94. Each unit uh, level has um, the same meaning as, if, as every other unit level. Whereas in the rank orders, as I said before, the fourth place finisher even though they're only one unit away from the third place finisher, may actually, according to the construct, have done much worse than one unit. Whereas in body temperature and IQ and those kind of variables that are equal in interval, a low score of a certain unit is, a, is the same as uh, a high score of a certain unit or lower scores of a certain unit. The unit has meaning and integrity in and of itself. Now, naturally, you want to have uh, equal interval scales for your statistics because they represent a mathematical ordering of the construct in a very consistent, reliable, valid way. If you have rank orders and categorical variables, you can analyze those with statistics, but the, the analysis is necessarily weaker than the ones that are done with equal interval scales. If you're conducting a study, you want to design your instrumentation so that you have equal interval scales. Often it's very, it's very um, um, uh, conducive to, you know, simple-minded human reasoning to take equal interval scales and simplify the orders or categories because it looks like you're clarifying things and you're making things uh, easier to see in terms of relationships and things like that. But all you end up doing is, <clears throat> is eliminating information when you do that. You want to try to think in terms of complex scaling if that, if that matches the construct. And sometimes constructs are defined as rank orders and categories, and sometimes they're not. And if you really want to study a certain construct, you got to scale it should be according to the theory of that construct and not reduce it to a set of categories just because it's easier to, and simpler to visualize the uh, variability, visualize the means and central tendency of the scores, and generally visualize your results easier. Uh, you want to scale things as clearly and as mathematically uh, clean as you possibly can. And that means equal interval scales and ratio scales. Don't ever back away from those if that's how your construct is really, is really designed to be scaled that way. Okay, frequency tables and distributions. Now imagine you go out and you do a study and you collect a sample of data. You go out and measure a sample of subjects on a construct. You go out and you give them an IQ test, or you give them a um, depression inventory, or you go out and measure the body temperature. Uh, but you go out and you collect a set of uh, measurements. Well, it's going to be helpful the first step to figure out what the distribution of the scores looks like. How many highs do you have? How many lows do you have? How many people in the middle? And so on. And frequency tables are used to depict this. 
what you do is basically tally up how many people you have at each unit level of your measurement. So if you have body temperature, you go out there and you tally up how many people have 98.6, people have 98, how many people have you know 98.4, and so on. And that will give you a depiction of what the variability in the sample looks like. And frequency tables are used to do this. In the old days, they were done by hand. And your textbook, uh, I believe, has you do a few of them by hand. Now, uh, these days, of course, they're all done by computers. And um, they hand, computers handle this in two or three milliseconds. But it's important to understand, I think, conceptually what a frequency table is and how uh, frequency information is depicted. Well, frequencies in a sample distributions have characteristic shapes. And that's what we're going to discuss on the next uh, slide. Frequency tables and distributions, skewness. Skewness is the name for a characteristic shape of a distribution, like the ones you see here. Uh, when distributions are not uh, symmetrical around the mean or the average, they're referred to as being skewed. So skewness represents the kind of lopsidedness to the distribution. You can see where these are lopsided all in one direction here. These would all be referred to as being positively skewed because the tail uh, slopes off toward the positive of the horizontal scaling down there. So you can see the blue one here, there sort of piles up there on the left and trails off toward the right, which is the high end of the scale. And that's referred to as a distribution, a distribution that's positively skewed. In general, you don't want to have skewed distributions. You want them to be symmetrical. Uh, skewness is often a problem if it gets too extreme. Fortunately, it has to be pretty extreme before you, res you change the, the uh, procedures you're going to use. And we'll talk about that in later sections of the course. Again, though, skewness is this lopsided nature of distributions. And you can see where they, they uh, th these in particular trail off toward the right. And they're referred to as positively skewed. If they trailed off in the other direction, they'd be referred to as negatively skewed. Frequency tables and distributions uh, histograms. This is a graphic depiction of a frequency table, the data, the data that's from a frequency table, showing you the numbers of um, subjects that appear at different levels of your construct. And here you've got, uh, looks like temperature, and you have a lot of information there that came from the output of SPSS. But right now, just pay attention to the levels. You can see they vary along. There's 30, 35, 40, 45, 55, and so on. The height of the bar indicates how many subjects were at that level. So if you look at relative frequency over here on the left, you see that at um, level 40 was almost four people. At level 65, there was, looks like about... 11 people, or 11 measurements, 11 subjects. Well, as you look across this graph, you can see the shape of the distribution. How many are at the high level? How many at the low level? How many in between? And this particular graphic is representing a, a um, distribution shape called a skewed distribution. And a skewed distribution is one that's got not uh, symmetrical, so you don't have equal numbers on both sides of the mean, or both sides of the average. You can see here where you've got um, a lot of subjects toward the high end and very few toward the low end. Well, when you see a distribution shape like this, it's referred to as being skewed. And you always, you always indicate the direction of the skew by the tail. And the tail of the distribution here is stretching out toward the high end. So you would say this, this skew has a, this, a positive skew. The one down below, which is showing uh, precipitation, looks like, has also got a um, positive uh, skew. Uh, you can see here, though, it's very um, uh, dramatic. It's a very, you know, there's very, there's very few. Uh, uh, the mean is probably, um, you know, very close there to that maximum, that highest bar. And then there's very, very few. There's no levels to the left of it. And everything just sort of trails off toward the positive end of this distribution. So the uh, skewness here is also positive. In general, you don't want to have uh, variables that have skew. You can have a fair amount of skew before things fall apart in doing statistical analysis. Mostly you want to have bimodal distribution, symmetrical, what's referred to as bimodal. It has a, um, 
as many subjects below as there are above, more or less. Uh, skewness represents usually a uh, problem with your sampling. So you went out and sampled people at the high end here. Or it represents a problem with your scaling. So if your measurement tool isn't designed right, it will render scores that are inaccurate and will produce skews uh, when better scaling would have done uh, symmetrical distributions. Frequency distributions and tables, kurtosis. Uh, kurtosis is another term to describe the shape of a distribution. As you could imagine, distributions can be skewed, you know, lean, leaning off in one direction or another, or they can be uh, symmetrical, but they can be flat and squat, or they can be tall and narrow, or they can be sort of balanced in between. Each one of these types has, or each direction of the, of the um, curve has a name. The flat squat ones are called platycurtic, the tall narrow ones are called leptocurtic, and the sort of normal shaped ones are called mesocurtic. It's not so important to remember these names, I think, is the concept that, the, you, know, you, can, that a, you can have distributions that vary in this way. Now, it's, it's the most important thing I think to remember about kurtosis is that it's a reflection of, of uh, often of variability. If you have a tall, narrow distribution, that means the scores aren't far from the mean. So you can imagine if it was, if it was most extreme, then all the scores would line up on the mean, and you'd have just a line, one column of numbers that reflects the mean with no variability around them. And then the more squat and flat the distribution is, the more variability that there is in the scores. Uh, kurtosis does not really have a uh, big impact on statistics. It's a way of just describing the distribution. But since uh, kurtosis only refers to the, the height of the distribution and its dispersion across the horizontal axis, as long as distributions are symmetric, that's the important thing for statistics, they have to have equal numbers of highs and lows. If that varies too much, if there's you know, too many highs or too many lows, uh, that can screw up statistics, but simply having a narrow or a squat distribution uh, usually doesn't have much impact. Now, if there's no variability, if there's no variability around the mean, then that's the problem. But if there's some and, it's, and, it's, and the distribution is just tall and narrow, that's probably okay for, for most statistical procedures. Anyway, kurtosis refers to how high and narrow a distribution is versus how squat and short it is. Frequency tables and histograms. Exercise 1. Now we have a simple exercise to uh, generate frequency tables and histograms. This is the first exercise that gets you kind of used to um, SPSS and uh, running statistics on the computer. It's a very simple uh, procedure for just generating a frequency table and a histogram. Your textbook explains how to do this by hand. It also, your textbook has a section at the back of the chapter, the first chapter, on using SPSS, and it goes through in pretty much the same uh, level of detail that you would need to run it. Well, it's it's um, very clear step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. And I encourage you to go to that section, uh, of course, to learn how to use SPSS if you've never used it before. What we have here is data theoretically from a speed checkpoint. You know, if you're out there driving and the police want to check uh, whether people are speeding or not, We'll have checkpoints, and sometimes they flag people in and give them tickets. Sometimes they just sit there and measure um, speeds, and the presence of the police car usually causes people to slow down. Uh, what you have is a set of data of cars that are approaching the speed checkpoint. And we're, what we're going to do is make a frequency table, make a histogram, and this just generally describe the shape of the distribution. So if you haven't already, go to the textbook. Uh, find the section on using SPSS, and it has instructions for creating a frequency table. The first thing you've got to do, of course, is enter in your data. And when SPSS op uh, run SPSS, it will open to the data entry uh, section, the data entry window, and you'll see there uh, a spreadsheet, like you may have seen before if you use Excel or, or other kind of spreadsheet programs. And what you do is enter in these numbers for the speeds into column 1. And uh, you can just leave it variable 1 if you want. Enter in each cell, each one of these numbers. So in cell number 1 goes the number 32, 36, cell number 3, 42, and so on until you've got a column there. 
Now to get frequencies, you're going to use the Analyze menu of SPSS. You're going to choose Descriptive Statistics in that menu. And then you're going to choose Frequencies. And SPSS has a nice procedure for figuring out what your frequency uh, interval should be and you know spacing out your frequency counts so that they're not unwieldy. Decide, okay, I want different intervals. You know, I don't want the ones SPSS gives me if you want. But for right now, we'll just use the defaults in SPSS. So when you do that, uh, you'll see in the output window of SPSS, when you choose those, men those um, options, you'll get a dialog box that asks you for the variable. Then once you choose the variable and click OK, it'll then run the analysis and give you a frequency table. Again, you can do this by hand according to the procedure that's all in the same chapter. Um, or use the SPSS for it. Now to create the histogram, <coughs> you go to the uh, charting section. You're going to use that. Actually, you know, there's different ways to make histograms in SPSS. Uh, use the procedure that's in your book, though. Um, go to the Analyze menu, choose Descriptive Statistics, choose Frequencies. And then when you go to the um, uh, Options for Charts, it'll ask you for them. And you tell it you want a histogram, and it, it will make one using its defaults. Usually that works out fine. You know, it depicts the um, a histogram fine if you just use the defaults. At any rate, do that and see what the distribution looks like. And this distribution ought to be, I'm not sure which how it's skewed or not. It's been a while since I actually did this analysis. But again, if, it, if, the, uh, if there's a tail to it, if it trails off to one side or it's skewed, and the direction it's trailing off to is used to describe the skewness. So if it's toward the higher end of the, of the scores, then it's a positive skew. If it's toward the lower end, then it's a negative skew. After you get done with that one, we'll go on to the next slide and um, graph the speeds of cars that are leaving the checkpoint. Okay, in the final slide, we have a continuation of the exercise before. Now you have data for the uh, cars leaving the checkpoint. Now presumably if um, people have noticed the checkpoint, their speeds are going to slow down. That's what you might hypothesize. However, it may not be everybody. If, if, if people are actually below the speed limit or at the speed limit, they won't necessarily slow down. There should be a general tendency probably for all cars to slow down some. But clearly the ones that were speeding, the people that were speeding, they ought to slow down a lot. And you can see this distribution shift uh, reflecting this. Enter these numbers as you did before. Look in your textbook for the procedure. Uh, make your histogram. Make your frequency table. And then look at the shape of the distribution for these numbers. Uh, how are they different? How is distribution 1 from the speeds of the people approaching the checkpoint different than the speeds of people following. And what statistics is going to enable, enable you to do is look at patterns like this and decide whether this could have occurred by chance or is this by design? Is this something that did not occur by chance? It's unlikely that a change like this in the distributions occurred for some reason. It, didn't, it just wasn't a chance phenomenon. Obviously, if you actually did go out and measure things this way, you're going to have variability of speeds for cars. And you're going to have people who are going to be, you know, different speeds before the checkpoint as opposed to their speed later. Uh, but the difference you see here, the difference that you see in the speeds might, and it could have occurred by chance. Well, you're going to be able with statistics to be able to assign a probability to this contrast, a probability to this difference between the speeds and make a probability judgment about the likelihood that these speeds, these numbers here, would have changed by chance. And that's the great strength of statistics. It gives you these probability judgments, which you can't exercise or use using normal human reasoning. And that way, it enables you to, to reason more clearly, more deductively, and using uh, measurement instead of your hunches. I should also state that when you uh, enter the data this time, you can, of course, enter these numbers, the second set of numbers, as a second column of, uh, of numbers. You don't have to restart SPSS data entry and enter these in column 1. You can enter the first number set in column 1 and enter these in column 2. And then when you run the analyze procedure and get the dialog box, 
point to this variable, variable 2, instead of variable 1, to get your distribution for this one. If you have questions about running SPSS, if it was difficult for you, you, have, you couldn't figure it out, please ask questions in the discussion forum. Send email to your, your friends or send email to me, and we'll work it out. The book, though, make sure you follow the instructions there. I find that the book has got things very, very clearly mapped out. It even shows you pictures of what SPSS looks like when you're making, uh, you know, when you're dropping down menus and making choices. So I find the book and the workbook to be uh, very clear. So if you have initially problems, just go back to those, try it again, and see if you can make it work. SPSS has gotten a lot easier, and now with drop-down menus and choices like this, it's usually not too, it's, you know, sometimes hard to make mistakes. And even if you make a mistake, it's very easy to recover from it.